get the morning light, avoid bright light in the evening, mm -hmm. uh, late at night and throughout the night. So that's a, a do so there's a do and a don't there. Yeah. Train hard for, you know, 45 minutes to 60 minutes, two to four times a week, mm -hmm. right? I think that's reasonable. Uh, um, so warm up and then go hard for 45 to 60 minutes. You could do the Duncan French protocol or you could do something similar, but yeah. past 60 minutes, unless you have s superb recovery capacity, if you, tr if you try and push for two hours mm. at max capacity, you will have an increase in cortisol and a decrease in testosterone. If you rest three days, you'll be fine. If you're one of those genetic freaks that can do that repeatedly, fine. But for most people, really intense effort for 45 to 60 minutes, maybe 75, maybe 90. Again, it's not like a gate shuts, right? A few, you know, some ab work at the end of your workout or a little neck work or something isn't gonna send cortisol into the roof. But if you finish your squats and then you then you deadlift and then you leg press and then you and you're up into the two hour range, you you're going to drop your testosterone, no question. Yeah. Okay. So do that two to four times a week. Then also it is important and this is often overlooked to get some level two, zone two cardio two to four times a week. This is, uh, the reason it's overlooked is that people forget how testosterone is actually liberated into the body to do what it does, both for the brain and for the muscles. And, for, and that's all mediated by vasculature. And so you need your cardiovascular system working well. Well, people say, well, no, I know guys who are just blasting tea and they, they don't do any cardio. Okay, but that's different because they're overriding the system, right? But for most people, they shy away from doing cardio. Now, I do think that the evidence that sprinting, that hit type workouts can increase testosterone is quite good. And those sort of serve as a more like a weight training workout though. I'm talking about zone two cardio. So where it's a little bit uncomfortable to have a conversation. Mm. Watch one of um, Mark's posts where he's out there like I'm pushing, walking and he's talking and you can tell he can get the sentences out, but he's right on that edge where if he went any faster or harder, you know, he might have to catch his breath. Keel over. <laughs> right. Something so like that twice a week. Jiu-jitsu. Okay. And that brings up another thing. If you really want to get into the behavioral tools, competition mm. induces the release of testosterone even if you lose. So there was some stuff written in the early 90s about, oh, you know, day traders who, if they lose money, their testosterone drops. Eh, the evidence is okay, it's not great. Wins definitely increase testosterone, sure. But competition is great. So it could be competition with yourself, but inter-species competition, um, intra and inter-species competition. Yeah. So the hunters understand what I'm talking about. I'm not a hunter, but Andy Galpin, you know, he's really into hunting and, uh, I remember Joe Rogan was telling me on the podcast I did with him last was when I went on his podcast, he was talking about hunting in this, this, this is a primal relationship to, to the world. Now, most of us, including me, aren't, aren't hunters. So what, what does this look like? It's jujitsu, it's soccer, it's even playing pool, you know, competition is good and be willing to lose. I mean, one of the, one of the things that we have to get comfortable with is is losing and still feeling the lift that we got from competing. Anytime that you have to push against some resistance, external or internal, you are in a great place to increase dopamine and testosterone. This I deal with this challenge on a regular basis. So I wake up in the morning, there's so many things that are easy and distracting or just boring and fill the time. But I've learned that if I can struggle with something, get a paragraph out on a book or get through a hard, analysis for a paper or something like that, really struggling with it. When you finish it, you feel great. And my colleague at Stanford, Anna Lemke, um, has a great book. I'll plug it since it is so great. It's called Dopamine Nation. And, and she talks about, it's a lot of it's about addiction, but she has a chapter in there about pain and how ice baths and workouts and things like that, when you engage in pain, and I don't mean physically damaging pain, but pain like training and those kinds of things that afterwards there's a long release of dopamine much longer than you would get from any drug so the pain that you experience then or from an ice bath or something yeah it's going to carry over into a long release of dopamine that the dopamine starts about 30 minutes after you cease this painful experience mm -hmm. again non-tissue damaging pain um what happens from there La that dopamine continues to rise for until two and a half hours later and then it starts to taper off, but it doesn't go below baseline for almost 24 hours. So as you start to lose that dopamine increase, um, 
there isn't necessarily a compensation unless it's something that has a huge release. So a good example would be uh, the, the push, it, the yin and yang of uh, dopamine is a hormone called prolactin. Now prolactin is a really interesting hormone. Okay, it is associated with milk letdown in females. It's part of the lactation pathway, oxytocin. And men, right? And men, and expecting fathers, their prolactin goes up, and it helps them put on body fat, retain body fat from the same caloric load, right? Same caloric load in the presence of prolactin, more body fat. It, you know what you find is that there are hormone effects that can override or at least adjust that equation okay so this is to prepare parents of all species for care of the young now prolactin and dopamine have a very magical relationship during mating and reproduction so desire to mate high test it increases dopamine and testosterone okay mating itself under those circumstances dopamine is released so during sex dopamine is released but after orgasm and eject and ejaculation this is key because there's a lot of questions about this on the internet prolactin levels go up and dopamine levels drop why well pair bonding in our species is very important and if we were the type of species where immediately after mating we were going off seeking another mate a lot of our social structures wouldn't look the way that they do okay there are species of animals that just mate 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 mate, mate with as many as they can but even there the capacity to mate is set by how much prolactin is around. It inhibits reprodu it inhibits further sexual behavior. How do we know this? Well, things that blunt prolactin allow for a shorter refractory period in males. 